Thank you, Pearl and Sally, uh, for leading us in our worship time. And thank you, uh, Christian, for your thoughts and prayers. And appreciate that very, very much and uh, keeping us on track. Would turn your attention to our invitation hymn, which is Give Me Thy Heart. I don't know the number. I don't have that in front of me, is it? It's not in the book? Okay. It'll be on the screen. Well, you see it so often, you probably forget that it's there. I mean, every time you go to buy a Coke out of a vending machine uh, and you drop in some change, maybe in the fireman's booth at some stop sign for Jerry's kids, or uh, you know, every cash register where you leave pennies for change for the next customer or something like that, there's a simple phrase, and it's, in God we trust. But do you know how... That all came about. Back after the Civil War, Secretary of Treasury, Salmon P. Chase, received many appeals from Christians throughout the country urging the United States to recognize the deity of the United States on coin. One such appeal came from a preacher in Pennsylvania. His name was R.W. Watkinson, and he wrote, Dear Sir, you are about to submit your annual report to Congress regarding the affairs of the national finances, and one fact touching our currency that has been seriously overlooked is the recognition of Almighty God in some form on our coins. What if our republic was shattered beyond recon reconstruction? Would not the people of succeeding centuries rightly reason from our past that we were a heathen nation because our currency does not acknowledge God. To recognize God on our coinage would place us openly under the divine protection which we have personally claimed. Well, as a result of that, Secretary Chase instructed the director of the Mint in Philadelphia to prepare a motto on the coin. And Secretary Chase wrote, no nation can be strong except in the strength of God or safe except in his defense. The trust of our people in God should be declared on our national coin. And so Congress then passed on February 12th of 1873 the Coinage Act, and it said that the secretary may cause the motto, In God We Trust, to be inscribed on all coins. And those same words appear even today. And not only just on coins, but also on our currency. Today we are looking ahead to Thursday, to Independence Day as a nation. And I want us to look at a passage from the book of Psalms. And we're going to spend the majority of our time in Psalm 33, trying to determine if we really trust in God. Psalm 33, 12 said, Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. And so the people, he says, to the people he chose for his inheritance. So we want to be that nation. That God is watching over all mankind. He is considering everything that we do. In, in verses 13 to 15 there in Psalm 33, it says, From heaven the Lord looks down and sees all mankind. From his dwelling place he watches all who live on earth. He who forms the hearts of all, who considers everything they do. Well, how can we make sure that we are a nation that God blesses? I mean, as a nation, we need to, again, put our hope and trust in Almighty God. And as God's people, we need to lead the way. I mean, we are, we're going to look at a couple of contrasting views here of trust that are both found in Psalm 33. And I first want us to look at and discuss misplaced trust. Our tendency is to put our trust in things that won't save us. Psalm 33, 16 and 17 tells us, no king is saved by the size of his army, no warrior escapes by his great strength. A horse is a vain hope for deliverance despite all its great strength, it cannot save. 
And so one of the places that nations mistakenly put their trust, and we mistakenly put our trust is in, is in military might. No king is ever saved by the size of his army. Now that doesn't mean we shouldn't have a military. It just means that we should not expect that we can be saved from disaster simply because we have the biggest and the strongest and the mightiest army. And we've learned that through the years that we can't trust in chariots. We can't trust in, in military vehicles. I mean, to, to protect us. We can't say in the military we trust, especially since 9-11 when it was just a handful of planes and a handful of terrorists who, who changed our lives forever. Every time we catch a flight, we're reminded of it in some fashion or another. I believe in having a strong military to protect us and our freedoms that we've enjoyed and to help protect those other folks that are in need. But regardless of how strong or how mighty or how large our military is, it is not where we should put our hope. Another place that people mistakenly put their trust in is in strong leadership. Verse 16, the second part of, of, of that 33rd Psalm is no warrior escapes by his great strength. And that's true, really, of any company. It's true of any country. It's true of any city or any organization. I mean, we got a lot of charismatic leaders in our world today, warriors with great strengths. And while politicians and, and civil servants can do a lot of good for us, we got to realize that the government can't save us. The government can't save us. The government is not God. What was it that President Reagan said, those number of words that were terrible words? I, I'm from the government, I'm here to help, or something like that. The government can't save us. Uncle Sam can't save our souls. In fact, Uncle Sam's having a hard enough time taking care and keeping our, our troops and volunteers safe. Psalm, the psalmist said in Psalm 20, verse 7 and 8, some trust in chariots, some in horses, but we trust in the name of the Lord our God. They're brought to their knees and fall, but we rise and we stand for. See, that's what kind of makes Christians different and distinctive from all others. Because we strive anyhow to live like we believe. I mean... The Christ follower buys into the belief system that says, I put my trust in God. And then we try to live like we believe that. There's a sign in an Atlanta police station that says, uh, in God we trust, others we polygraph. <laughs> Acknowledge the source of our trust. England and their 10-pound currency, which is equivalent, I guess, somewhere around $20, American dollars, you'll see the picture of Charles Darwin. You'll see, he, he's introduced the concept of evolution to the world, and that's who England puts on the 10-pound currency. Well, I, you know, like the U.S., we put leaders from our country and on our currency, and I'm really happy that we got George Washington and Abraham Lincoln on ours, and that each of those bills we also have in God we trust. I got to thinking some, someone might say, yeah, if you only have ones and fives, you've got to put your trust in God because your back is always up against the wall. God wants us to choose leaders, though, who honor him. Is it wrong for our leaders to be strong? No. Is it wrong for our leaders to be charismatic? Not in the least. It's just not the most important thing. It's probably not even the second or third most important thing. And so we don't want to be swayed by that or think that a great leader is going to save us. Many people trust in our own security. Verse 17 says that a horse is vain hope for deliverance despite all the great strength it cannot save. So let's go back and try to put ourselves back in the setting of, of biblical times. Because in biblical times, horses were powerful military weapons. A horse would be uh, 
you know, able to provide certain security to people and especially if you were fortunate enough to own one or own your own. I mean, I've got my own horse. That's kind of like saying and communicating, I've got my own means to be able to escape or I can go wherever I want when I want. And Americans, we kind of like to think that way, don't we? I mean, I've got a beautiful car or I've got a beautiful home. Or I've got an incredible 401k. Or I've got a great grouping of stocks. Or I've got a nice stockpile of weapons and guns. Or I've got a lot of extra ammo. Or uh, I've got an, an alarm system. Or I'm taking self-defense classes. And it's tempting for us to put our security in our own independence. And there's nothing wrong with any of those things. Not a thing. It's just that they don't provide salvation. And those things are vain hope for deliverance. In other words, our vanity, our pride, makes us think that we're safe when we're not. Isn't it interesting that the things that keep us from putting our trust in God are oftentimes the things that the Lord has blessed us with? Some years, better, more so than the others, but it might be the economy, or it could be our career, or it could be our family, and it could be our possessions. Not any of those are bad in and of themselves unless they become our source of trust. Okay, we've looked at misplaced trust, but let's change gears now and let's look at the second side of proper trust. Where should we put our trust? Some 33, 20, verse 20, uh, 20 and 21 says, We wait in hope for the Lord. He is our hope, our help, and our shield. In Him our hearts rejoice, for we trust in His holy name. So first off, we trust in God's word. Verse 4 of our text reminds us that the word of the Lord is right and true. And in Psalm 119, there in one, the 105th verse says, Your word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. you got to go back some years, but remember Hurricane Katrina? And there was a, a, a Fox story that happened over the super, a Superdome. And I just remember catching on this because I had been to the Superdome uh, some years before. But one of the things that came out, the number one most, most requested item for the people that were in the Superdome, housing there during uh, Katrina, the number one item that they asked for was a Bible. Now, does that seem strange to you? Well, it, really, it shouldn't. I mean, where is it that people turn when the temporary things of this world become obliterated? The French philosopher Blaise Pascal says there is a God-shaped vacuum in the heart of man. First Peter tells us that the word of the Lord will last forever. And we might get off course at times, but if we continue to dig in, especially into God's word, and follow his blueprint, we can do okay. Now, I'm the worst handy man there is. I'm just pitiful. My dad could fix anything. He was really gifted at that. He could fix anything. He used to say, I can fix anything but a broken heart. And I thought, you know, he did pretty good on those too. My brother is even better than my dad was when it comes to being able to fix. That gene skipped me big time. Well, about six, eight years ago, we bought a gas grill, and I thought maybe I could save some money if I put it together. And so I, it, it should only take a couple hours. That's what they said. And so uh, I tried to follow the instructions and, you know, through course, uh, everything here in, in the construction of it all. It was, I, I used a, a lifeline. I called my dad. He was still with us then. And so I picked his brain a little bit. I even drove back and took a, a notepads and looked at the floor model to make comparison. That was before my you know, I had a, an iPhone so I could take pictures with my phone that I could see. And, and uh, all of that, and a simple, that had, it's only supposed to take a couple hours, but that had to be the most frustrating month of my life. 
You know, I wanted to say when I got it all together, hey, Joanna, do you want to fire this thing up? <laughs> but, every, you know, every time I got stuck, the answer was right there in the instructions. Now, to be honest, sometimes I had to study it over and over again, read it word for word multiple times, study the diagram, travel back to the store. But once I got the proper piece in the proper place, it starts to make sense. And during the process, I would have told you that the directions weren't any good. But after the project was completed, and when I looked at the directions again, I'd have to say that they were good. They were faithful and true. Now, there are times some people say, well, the Bible isn't relevant today. I mean, how could something so old be so practical and so functional? But it is because it's not the words of men and women. It's the word of God. And he's the one whose image in which we are created. This nation was founded on the Ten Commandments. Uh, and we are, have a creator who endowed us with certain unalienable rights. See, the Bible is not a buffet that we can browse around for to pick up in what we choose to be truth or not. You either trust God's word or you don't. And it was founded upon the person of Jesus Christ. So we trust in God's word. Next, we also trust in God's plan. God's plan, his plans are done with an eternal perspective. Verse 13 and 14 sta uh, states, from heaven, the earth from heaven, the Lord looks down and, and sees all mankind from his, his dwelling place. He watches all who live on earth. You remain faithful. You, you come to church. You stay in God's word. You interact with other Christians. And the Lord will reveal his plans. He will actually give you specific plans. Corey Ten Boone said, Never be afraid to trust an unknown future to a known God. Now, we're probably familiar with Jeremiah 29, 11, But what we may not know is that it was actually directed more to the nation of Israel than it was to any individual. We Today, it seems like everybody applies it to them, themselves individually. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and in a future. See, God wants this nation to prosper if we will be obedient. And that passage is good advice for our country and its citizens, but we need to trust God's plan nationally as well as individually. Back in the 90s, uh, Henry Blackaby was the author of a very impacting Bible study called Experiencing God. And one of the things Blackaby taught in raising children for families, he said, that you don't just want your children just to know the Bible story of Daniel. You want to raise up a Daniel, a man of integrity who's willing to take a stand. Parents, I want your daughters, he said, to, to do more than just know Esther's story. I want her to become an Esther, willing to be different and stand out from everyone else. See, back in the Old Testament, Ezra had proclaimed his faith in God's ability to protect the caravan as they traveled to Jerusalem. And so he was kind of embarrassed to ask for any kind of human protection. And in Ezra chapter 8 there in verses 22 through 32, he goes, I, I, I'm ashamed to ask the king for soldiers and horsemen to protect us from the enemies of the road because we told the king the gracious hand of our God is on everyone who looks at him. But his great anger is against all who forsake him. So we fasted and petitioned our, our God about this, and he answered our prayer. The hand of our God was on us, and he protected us from enemies and bandits along the way. So we arrived in Jerusalem where we rested three days. Ezra turned down human help in order to get divine help. In God, we trust. And he's a demonstration of faith. The Lord gently nudged Ezra 
to, to choose not to trust the things of this world, but to rather to trust Almighty God. And I don't know about you, but it seems slowly the devil is trying to chip away at us as individuals to where we might say maybe to something that we used to say flat out no to. He wants our eyes to be blinded to what's happening all around us. Bruce Larson was on a, a vacation with his family and they were traveling to California. They're driving through California and they were looking at all the scenery and the parks and stuff like that. And there was a sign that said, Naturalist Camp. And so Larson said, we love creation and God's beauty. Let's just turn and go down that road. And a little way down the road, they were passed by five people on bicycles. And he said, not one of them was wearing a stitch of clothes. And he said, my observant son, sitting in the back seat, goes, Dad, did you see that? And he goes, yes, son. And he goes, none of them was wearing a helmet. <laughs> Through the gradual moral decline of our country, we become oblivious to the obvious. What used to be black and white issues of right and wrong have, have faded into gray. And we've become blinded by so many things. And our perspective has been skewed. And the reason our perspective is skewed is because we've got an agnostic media, we have atheistic professors, we've got lukewarm Christians, and we've got wimpy preachers who prefer popular opinion over biblical truth. Thomas Sewell said... Once you open the floodgates, you can't tell the water where to run. So we must trust in God's plan and all the while choose to follow in his directions for our lives. And it's, I know it's easier said than done. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, remember, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. And in all your ways acknowledge him and he will make your path straight. He will direct your paths. America is a great country. But especially in the last 40 years, there have been times when as a nation, we haven't been leaning on God's word. We haven't been following God's plan. Now, I, I consider myself patriotic, but I hope that I don't overstep that boundary. But I also hope that my first allegiance always stays to Jesus Christ. That that's who my, where my heart should belong, because he should be my passion. Finally, we're to trust in God's love. Psalm 33, verse 18 to 21 says, But the eyes of the Lord are on those who fear him, on those whose hope is in his unfailing love, to deliver them from death and keep them alive in famine. We wait in the hope for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. In him our hearts rejoice, for we trust in his holy name. In other words, in God we trust. Before I read verse 22, let me remind you that if there was ever anyone who could teach us about God's love, it was the man who wrote these words, King David. I mean, he was an incredible leader. He was a man after God's own heart. He was had come through some valleys in his life, a time of disappointing God in a major, major way. And yet he learned to trust in God's love. And though through lying and deceit and murder and family turmoil, if anyone would know about God's love after disappointing God, it would be King David. Yet this is what he writes in verse 22. He says, May your unfailing love rest upon us, O Lord, even as we put our hope in you. It begs the question, how did David know God's love was still unfailing if he didn't feel that after his terrible sin? You see, Jesus Christ is the embodiment of God's love. And as a nation, we boldly trust in Jesus. Christ as the way, the truth, and the life. And if we would do that, we could change our nation. 
And it's interesting to me because earlier in the, in the chapter, we see what happens when our trust is misplaced and what occurs then when it is properly placed in the Lord. <clears throat> Verse 10 and 11 says, The Lord foils the plans of the nation. He thwarts the purposes of the peoples, but the plans of the Lord stand firm forever, the purposes of his heart through all generations. Usually we kind of get swayed in a couple of different extremes. One is that America is God's favorite. So in a couple weeks when the Lord's watching the Olympics, we know he's going to be rooting for the red, white, and blue. And that's kind of the way we think sometimes. The other extreme is that we think that America's doomed. It's because there's so much moral decline over the decades. It's over. We might as well just throw in the towel, close up shop, because nothing we can do or say is going to be able to change any of that. But don't give hope up hope yet, just yet. Consider how often Israel rebelled and was disciplined, but repented and was blessed again. This nation can still be a nation whose God is the Lord. It's not too late. We just need to pray for God to again pour out his Holy Spirit and bring a, a revival to America. Now, if you look to closely to the, to the title of the sermon you'll notice that it wasn't in God we trust. It's, it's not a statement, but it's a question. See, these days, we have, have to wrestle with whether that's because more of a slogan or if it's become more of a description. You know, uh, is it a, actually a true barometer of our, how we, you know, our faith and our feelings? Is the phrase in God we trust really an accurate description of how we as a nation believe? Or is it time for us to, to step back and, and draw back where we can get some instruction from where we need to be going and, and allow it to teach us and train us? This, this going a little deeper, is it the truth for those of us who embrace Christianity to say, in God we trust? Because as Christians go, that's the way marriages go. And as marriages go, that's the way families go. And that's the direction that communities go. And that's the direction the country will go. But notice, we can't legislate or command that. Trust and faith are personal choices. And so if we want to radically transform our country, we can't radically transform the country with the White House or the Houses of Congress. It begins with your house and my house. In God, we trust it's time we step to the plate. And while I love America and I'm going to defend it to anyone in the same breath, I have to acknowledge that there... We, there's less trust in America today than there was yesterday. And we got to step up to the plate and say, in God, we trust. Wayne Cordero was a preacher in Hawaii who tells of a few years back how he went to uh, China to, uh, to visit with 20 leaders of the house church movement that they were asking him to be a part of a leadership conference there. And so these guys dressed very humble. They were farmers. They adorned very simply. They had deep etched lines within their face, uh, uh, revealing stories of trial and victory for sure. So he decided he wanted to get to know these guys as they were starting off this conference. And he asked if they could share anything about him. And one guy said he had just got released from 12 years in prison for high crimes faith in an unseen Messiah is a high crime. And so he asked, how many of you others of, of you have been in, in, imprisoned for your faith? And of the 20, 18 hands raised. He said, if the government had discovered that little non-registered religious meeting in these home group leaders, they had immediately been, uh, uh, the leaders would have three years in jail and he would have been deported instantly within 24 hours. One of the men shared, he said, uh, when they're in prison, he said, we use our time in memorizing scripture because we smuggle in one page at a time. Uh, and then the, one man said, you see what the guards can take away the paper, but they can't take away what I've already hidden in my heart. 
So when the two days had concluded of their having this conference together, he, he was just fell in love with these guys. And, and it was a daunting task that they were trying to reach the, the nation of China with the gospel. And he said, how can I pray for you? What do you want most? And they said, pray that we become like you. That was their immediate request. He said, we don't have freedom of religion. We have a few registered churches and the rest people can't attend. And so we're a persecuted church. So pray that we will soon be like you. And Wayne goes, I couldn't, I can't do that. And he said, in fact, I will not do that. I won't pray that for you. And they were taken back and they said, but why? He said, you came here riding 13 hours on a train in America. If you're more than 30 minutes away, people will say it's too far and they won't go to church. You're sitting on wooden floors here in an unair conditioned room for two days to hear somebody talk about the word of the Lord. And if you were to come from where I come from, we sit on cushioned chairs or cushioned pews with air conditioning and comforts. And if we don't have that, there's, there's something better thing we can look forward to do with our time. You, you don't have adequate Bibles, yet you memorize your scriptures. And in our country, the average Christian home has at least three Bibles, and they don't get read. He said, no, I will not pray that you become like us, but I will pray that I become, we become like you. See, I think in America as Christians, we become soft and we become complacent with Christianity, myself included. Uh, I confess, I mean, I've been tempted to listen to the voice of Satan as he whispers to, you know, choose a more interesting topic to talk about or avoid controversial subjects or mention the Bible. Don't preach from Scripture. It's a temptation to compromise. But we got to resolve. God's church will become one of two things as spoken of in the New Testament in one of two ways. One is, is the American church will going to find itself in intense persecution and will be forced to take a stand whose side we're on. And throughout the Bible, persecution has been the way that the, the church grew the most and developed strength to deepen the relationship with God with believers. He said in the second way uh, is, isn't, original here by any stretch with me uh, but that is in second chronicles seven fourteen, which was president reagan's favorite passage but it says if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways then i will hear from heaven forgive their sins and will heal their land so if you and i want to change the country the first we got to change ourselves and we can't do that on our own We've got to have the power of the Holy Spirit empowering us, transforming us, so that we can experience what it means to be an adopted child of God. One way is to humble ourselves and pray and turn from our wicked ways. And maybe we can do that today because if we can do that today, then we can change. Then maybe our family can change. And if our family can change, then maybe our neighborhood can change. If our neighborhood can change, maybe our workplace or our community can change. And if our community can change, then maybe America can change and be a different place because there are people who are trusting in God. This morning, as we come to our invitation, we're going to sing, Give Me Thy Heart. And so our challenge today is that if you've never stepped out in faith and said, I believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. I want to confess his name before men. I want to live for him. I'm willing to repent and acknowledge that I am not perfect, but he is perfect, and I'm trusting in his perfection. I'm, I, I want to submit to baptism so I can have his blood wash me, clean, cover me, envelop me so that I can live in faith for him. There are others maybe who, who need just to say, I, I need to be a part of this church because as, a, as this church is stronger through the power of the Holy Spirit, we become stronger as a nation. So if there is a decision that anybody has in their heart today, we invite you to share that with us. You just meet me down front. 
Won't you stand as we sing, Give Me Thy Heart. Says the Father of above, all gifts so precious to Him as our love. Sons, be wherever Thou art. Gratefully trust Thee and give me Thy heart. Give me. There it goes. <laughs> Appreciate your presence here today. I hope that you've been blessed as we've had this opportunity to be together. And I hope you have uh, plans for a, a wonderful fourth. And I appreciate the, the whole service recognizing the blessings that we have as a nation, but also are grateful for the freedoms we truly have. Don't forget the announcements that are on the screen as they'll be rolling through there or in the bulletin. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, I thank you so very much, Lord, that your word gives us examples of what to do, how to uh, place our trust in you, and how, Father, to avoid the, the missteps of placing our trust in things that aren't where we need to be. So, Lord, help us to uh, be a people who are called by your name to humble ourselves and to pray and to seek your face. Help us individually be willing to do that, to, to examine ourselves, seeking your face, turning from our wicked ways. And, and we pray, Lord, that you would help us as you heal our land. Lord, thank you again for the privilege and honor of living here in this great nation. And may we always say thank you and have grateful hearts. Lead us, we pray, Father, as we leave this house. We pray that you'll lead, guide, and direct us as we uh, go into this next week. And we can thank you so very much for loving us. For it's in the precious and holy name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Have a good day.